Hello everyone, my name is Dr. James Barbary and I serve as the chair of the Wayne County Food Council. I would like to thank each of you for taking time out of your schedules to attend this important event. The mission of the Wayne County Food Council is to equip communities to provide healthy, affordable, and nutritious food so that all Wayne County residents might have access regardless of economic means. We do this through events such as this to bring awareness and through supporting efforts to educate the populace on the benefits of healthy choices and through continued support for local food pantries and other community initiatives. I'm also an associate professor of education in the School of Education here at Indiana University East. The School of Education works to develop effective educators for our schools in ways that positively impact students and their education. We are quite proficient in this with the 100% employment rate for our graduates over the past five years. Teachers that graduate from the School of Education are skilled and professional and are routinely in great demand to join area schools. And while we can develop the skill sets of a teacher to meet the professional demands of this essential profession, there are still factors that fall outside professional training that have a notable impact on student experiences in schools. In this instance, I am referring to food insecurity. In schools across Wayne County, there are approximately 9,500 students. Of this larger group, 80% are currently on free and reduced lunches and meals. Of this 80%, almost 1,300 students, roughly 18% of that population, regularly experience food insecurity. From an educator's perspective, this is untenable. Food security brings with it several side effects to a student's time in school. It has a direct effect <coughs> on attention span, the motivation to learn, and brings about increased levels of stress for young people. There is also the negative impact from a physical and intellectual developmental perspective when there is a lack of what the body needs. Right here on the campus of Indiana University East, the Food Council's own Deanna Cooper operates a food pantry for college students, an undertaking which she originally envisioned and founded through the Center for Health Promotion and the School of Nursing. We are educating students to eventually take our places as contributing members of the larger economy. This is not possible when the real experience of food insecurity is palpable for so many. We can do better. An important first step is discussing this openly, as food insecurity is not a topic that many people openly share that experience it. Those that do not experience it may be simply unaware. That is the reason for this event. There are several people that I would like to thank for the time they contributed toward organizing and or participating in this event. Elisa Worland from the Wayne County Food Council and the Purdue Extension Office here in Wayne County for spearheading the, the idea of this event. Members of the Wayne County Food Council for embracing this idea and pursuing it. Becky Marvel from the Fayette County Food Council and Fayette County Purdue Extension Office. Patrick Ripperger from Mezzo Solutions. Hannah Snoddy, Ted Chalk, Deanna Cooper, all members of the Wayne County Food Council. Lindsay Freed, Whitewater Community Television, representatives from NATCO, Bread for the World, Gleaners Food Distribution, Indiana, Eastern Indiana Works, and the staff from the Office of External Affairs here at IU East for their expertise and support in the logistics of this event. I would also like to thank the Indy Hunger Network for their time in the production of this documentary. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank Dr. Jerry Wild, Dean of the School of Education here at IU East, for recognizing this as an important issue that affects the lives of some of our most vulnerable citizens, and embracing the sponsorship of this event on behalf of the School of Education. Thank you again. And I would also say thank you to my students that showed up today. Bravo to you, extra credit is taken care of. I would now like to turn the facilitation of this event over to Patrick Ripperger from Mezzo Solutions. Thank you. All right, thank you all for being here today. I'm going to have the opportunity to guide you through tonight's uh, film presentations and guided facilitation. So first we're gonna start with the Working Hungry film. After that, we're gonna watch a small video, very short about food insecurity here in Wayne County talking about some statistics and also some health outcomes that come with food insecurity.
Following that, we're gonna have some presentations from groups who are here to talk about what they're doing to work to reduce food insecurity in our community. And we're gonna have some time for audience comments after the facilitated discussion. So we're gonna start the film now. This film lasts for roughly 30 minutes. Um, we're gonna dim the lights a bit and uh, really dive into this story of families in Indiana who are experiencing food insecurity. Uh, this is a very impactful film. Uh, I want you to put your phones away now so that you aren't distracted um, after you finish that survey, of course, um, and really give your attention to the story. Uh, there's a lot of hardworking people who went into this, and some of them are actually here tonight, uh, which is amazing, um, because they helped really highlight how this is happening in our neighborhoods, um, in our cities, to people we know and see every day. The Working Hungry is funded by Ascension St. Vincent and these additional supporters. We lost everything, everything in that time frame. Lost family members because uh, people didn't think I was doing enough. I used to live on a farm and I used to come here and get groceries because I needed the help. It's worse now than it's ever been to keep going forward. Don't, don't give up, no matter what, you can't give up. If you're working, keep working, don't quit, don't stop. Everybody wants to be able to feed their kids without having to ask for help. In Indiana, the percentage of children going hungry has long been worse than the national average, about 15% statewide. Especially now, with a renewed national focus on hunger, you'll hear many statistics on families and children unable to access quality, nutritional food. In Indiana, the rate of childhood hunger varies from county to county, ranging from one in six children all the way to one in four, all numbers that are far too high. Looking at it another way, the Indiana Youth Institute's annual Kids Count Report asks parents about their ability to feed their children. In 2022, one third of families reported that food costs keep their kids from eating enough. Contrary to what you might think, most of these children are not homeless or neglected. They actually live in working families and have parents who are employed but still struggle to put nutritious food on the table. These are the kids next to my kids in classrooms. This is the person on the soccer team that I sit next to their parents and have no clue that they struggle every week. There are pockets of hunger throughout the entire state, not just in urban or rural areas. And I think that that would be one of the biggest fallacies that needs to be addressed, that hunger only exists in certain areas in the state. Hunger does not look alike for every child. The need for food assistance is being addressed by food pantries, by charities like churches, and by government programs like School Meals and SNAP, which provides 85% of the food. But food insecurity and hunger still reach deep into our Hoosier communities, into the lives of families you may know. It is all around us, often hidden and often where you least expect to find it. Families, especially those working hard to create the most normal life they can for their kids, don't want their neighbors to know how they struggle to keep food on the table. Yet it's a crisis that can impact every aspect of a child's life, now and far into the future. That's because poor nutrition in childhood creates poor outcomes for children and young people both in the short and long term. So I think that it's very important that people understand that Nutrition is a part of health. And so if you aren't able to get the foods that you need to remain healthy, it's very difficult to control your blood pressure or your blood sugar um, if you aren't eating the proper foods. And that impacts not only their physical health, but also their mental health. With school-aged children who are hungry, it can impact their ability to, to learn. Something as simple as not having the energy to play it can affect all your organ systems. Not having access to healthy food on a regular basis has a ripple effect across a child's life. Former Indianapolis Public Safety Director Troy Riggs knows from research, data, and what he's seen on the streets, how a lack of food undermines children's success. 
If a child shows up to school on Monday and they're hungry, they're not focused on schoolwork. They're focused on food. What about those families that have no idea when their next meal is going to be, how they're going to provide for their family member, their loved one? That will give you a sense of desperation that people are going through. According to the USDA, about 700,000 Hoosiers are what is known as food insecure. This hunger ranges across Indiana from border to border and affects families with children at a greater percentage. But why, at a time when unemployment is remarkably low and food is plentiful, are so many Hoosier children facing the painful reality of hunger? We have a, a world now that we have two income earners in a, in a home that possibly both have two jobs. They might be an Uber driver, and uh, people are just trying to make ends meet. And it's just not happening today. And it's really the, the hidden poverty of our time, the working poor. The, the conversation is always about rent, and no one wants to be homeless. And so patients will work that extra job or take an extra shift to be able to make sure that they can keep a roof over their head. And then I think that other things like food and other sustenance are uh, placed, you know, secondary or sometimes even tertiary because no one wants to be out on the street. I'm so disappointed that in, in the richest, uh, most powerful uh, country in the world that we, we, we have kids that go to bed hungry. Possibly one in five kids in the state of Indiana go, go to bed hungry. The USDA defines food security as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. U.S. Health and Human Services says food insecurity disproportionately impacts communities of color, people living in rural areas, people with disabilities, older adults, LGBTQ plus individuals, military families, and veterans. This is playing out right here at home in Indiana. Jim Morris is an executive with the Pacers basketball organization now, but for several years, he was executive director of the World Food Program, the food assistance arm of the United Nations. A child to be hungry is wrong, and it compromises the child's life from the very beginning. The child has no chance to be successful in school. Hunger is the single greatest health issue in the world. Everybody wants to be able to feed their kids without having to ask for help. Um, and especially parents that are working should be able to put food on their table. It shouldn't be so prohibitively expensive to support your family if you're working. When you think of poverty in America, what image comes to mind? Did you know that 85% of poor people live outside of high poverty neighborhoods? and that 85% of counties with persistent poverty are rural counties. Hunger doesn't know city boundaries. It is everywhere in Indiana. We're going to meet three Hoosier families, three working families trying to do everything right, but still fighting an uphill battle to keep their children fed. You should know you won't actually see very many children because the stigma of hunger is still very powerful. Looking back on life and the things I experienced here is things I don't want my children to experience. And so everything that I do now is to try to help build them a brighter future and to give them a, more of an opportunity to be successful in life. Lamont Hollins grew up on the Near East side of Indianapolis in a single parent home. When his mother was killed outside their apartment, young Lamont went to live with his grandmother a woman who epitomized the value of hard work and community to him. Lamont and his wife have always worked until Lamont suffered a debilitating shoulder injury while employed by a shipping company. Even then, Lamont found joy in mentoring young people and in feeding others. It was another value passed on by his grandmother. I had to find something that I could do, and that was something we started building off of. So when I come back from college, I, I lived here with my grandmother. By far, the favorite day of the week was Sundays, because you always knew um, that we were going to have a meal, a big meal. And so I grew fond of barbecuing, 
We grilled all the time, nonstop. It could be three o'clock in the morning when we was firing up the grill. Over years of working to build a barbecue business and simultaneously working around the legal issues of his injury, the Hollins family, including four sons, has faced successes and setbacks. I had multiple surgeries in between there trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, the disability process within itself was <laughs> a whole nother arena. The attitude was you keep working until you die. Still, the Hollinses kept cooking. An arrangement to sell their custom sauces didn't pan out. An east side restaurant let them barbecue in an adjacent parking lot until local ordinances on commercial cooking operations priced them out of business. So on the weekends, we would set up a tent. So it would be me, my wife, and the boys. The family ultimately moved out of Indianapolis to a suburb to be closer to the resources that could assist them and their children. Lamont is making the most of his time finishing his college degree while continuing to work in grocery delivery. His wife continues to work as well, and they still cater events for fans of their food. But as with many families struggling to keep the bills paid, every little setback, a car problem, an illness, keeps them from taking the next step towards success. Still, these parents are determined that they will leave their kids a better legacy than they had. We continue to work hard every day and crush down the roadblocks in front of us and opening up the path for them. Right. Hello. Hello. And this in here is our, our, our pig ride, our hog roast we're going to have, our silent auction, and we've got a motorcycle ride, and car show, a whole bunch of good stuff in there. Yeah. Carolyn Begley embodies the phrase, starting over. From the rural community of Jennings County in southeastern Indiana, Carolyn suffered a severe brain trauma in her 20s and has spent the intervening years relearning everything. I'd had brain surgery and I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know my colors. I had to relearn all my shapes, and my signs, and I've just learned how to read. Carolyn now works in the very food pantry that once helped her. She lives in what is termed a complex household, a situation in which more generations and family members live together because of strained financial circumstances. A widow, she now lives with her sister while helping raise her teenaged grandson. I used to live on a farm, and I used to come here and get groceries. Now, Carolyn works at the Good Samaritan Food Pantry, providing the services she needed then and still needs now. But she's making her way through a training program. It's like I was on disability when I first came here. We retrain under the, the National ABLE program. I, I relearn things. It's like I'm learning shipping and handling right now. The end of December of 2023 will be my end of my four years. And then I will be able to go on to the community. Financial security is still distant for Carolyn. She and her grandson had to pool their money for a repair on the car she uses to get them both to work. She's already been offered retail jobs, but remains committed to finishing her training program. When I first came here, I couldn't add, I couldn't spell, I couldn't use a calculator. I could not make a decision of any kind on my own. This is my purpose. Helping others and the pantry is my purpose is in life. God gave me a reason to live, a reason to help others, a reason to have to think. And these people here have helped me. Every morning I get up about five o'clock and you know, Monday through Friday and We just got to keep our head, you know, if we can just keep it above water, I'm okay. So I'll, I'll, I can survive, I have to. I have no choice. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, that has a lot to do with that, has a lot, a lot to do with being in the service, you know, for all those years, you know, having to get by. Oh, I can roll it up. Robert Miles did tours of duty in Bosnia and Afghanistan. He remains grateful for his ability to serve his country and has always found a sense of attainment in working. 
His family moved from their home in southern Indiana to Hamilton County because they believed the schools in Carmel would be a better fit for their son's special education needs. He has struggled for years to acquire a job that will allow them to find comfortable living conditions. That's why it's difficult here for me to go from job to job because I never felt stable or I never felt, I didn't have that, that feeling of accomplishment that I did when I was in service. You know, I felt like I was bulletproof. I felt like I was a superhero. When you put the uniform on, it just makes you feel like you're wearing armor. Like nothing can hurt you, nothing can bother you. After a lengthy and anxious application process, Robert was able to get a position he was hoping for at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Indianapolis. It is full-time work, and he finds it very fulfilling. You know, once you work at the VA, your job, your service never stops. You continue that, and it just, it just makes me feel good. So this is where I park every day, going here. I'll get my mask on and then get my bag of lunch together and this is it. Unfortunately, the Miles continue to struggle to find housing in their chosen community. Robert's wife homeschools their son while the couple continues to apply for rental houses. At the time we spoke to them, they were living in a hotel and being provided food through an agency. Rising home costs and technology issues many of us take for granted can impede families like theirs trying to take the next step up toward financial independence? Well, it's very complicated. Actually, they, when, the, you, when you fill it out, they, they require you to submit and upload pay stubs, bank statements possibly. They want your ID. Everything is online. When you put your credit card in to pay the fees, you know, who knows, that could be your last last money that you have, and you're giving it to someone else when it could feed your family. If you're living in poverty, you're likely to be moving around a lot. You're likely to be evicted or staying on your sister's couch for a while or um, trying to move into a safer neighborhood. And so all that moving can um, separate you from your important pieces of paper. And then getting copies of things actually costs money, which we don't always think about. So. Um, all those little things can be barriers that we don't think about in terms of accessing food. Christine Garner is the executive director of the Marshall County Neighborhood Center in Plymouth, Indiana. She's been witness to the same problems and frustrations for her entire life. I was born and raised in Plymouth. Um, as a young girl, I remember very vivid memories of my parents' Sunday school class providing Christmas for families in our community. And I can remember walking into homes that had dirt floors and just realizing this happens in my hometown. Like, it's just, that was a memory that I just can't, I can't ever shake. We just miss that rural image of families who are trying really hard and kids are left alone to fend for themselves or they just can't make their ends meet in a family and there's very limited supply of food in their house. The Marshall County Neighborhood Center isn't the only food pantry in Plymouth and the surrounding area, but it offers a wide range of services. Christine sees how every little setback from transportation to paperwork combines to create a massive barrier to families just trying to get by. And this is where I wish I could help people connect all these little dots. For example, a lot of factories, we have, we have a lot of factories, a lot of our middle income families are employed through a factory. They have a point system. So if you miss work and you have 10 points now because two points for missing work, a point and a half for being late one day or having to leave early or half a day, at 10 points you lose your job. Are they going to have to be home sometimes because their child is sick? And how do we make that okay? Not every family here has a grandma and an aunt and or an uncle or a sibling who can say, well, I'll come stay with your kid. They shouldn't be going to work if they're sick. They should be allowed to stay home. They should be allowed to take their child to a doctor. Cheese! <laughs> 
Pastor John Barker of Garrard Chapel in Bowling Green, Indiana, sees the working poor crisis play out at his church's food pantry month after month. The pantry is open eight days a month and serves clients from up to 15 surrounding counties. We try to provide everything for the family, from the seniors all the way to the youngest. And that's one reason we're open uh, on Wednesday and then we're open two nights a week, uh, second and third, and the second and the fourth Thursday for those parents that work because just because you work and make 10 or $12 an hour don't mean you support a family of two or three, all right? Uh, especially with the cost and uh, the, the drama that's going on in most of their lives today. Barker is a military veteran who will tell you his specialties are logistics and loving the people who come to his church and pantry. Important characteristics when upwards of 250 families come for food in a single day. I see stress in the parents. I see stress in the grandparents. I want to be healthy, I want to be happy. Those things food can give you, but it's just part of the, of the formula. One important barrier that we find with our families who are struggling to feed their children is pride. Many do not want to admit that they need the assistance. The first time I came in to get food here, I felt like the lowest of the lowest, but I felt like Man, this is really hitting the bottom. This is really low. And I felt really, really bad. Well, what we have found through the pandemic that a lot of us are a paycheck away from poverty, homelessness, and it's not just that certain section of people that we used to stereotype. Like, 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 how can you... How, how can you be proud if you're in this position, you know? If you're working full time, you should be able to meet your needs. You should be able to pay your rent. You should be able to put food on the table. You should be able to pay for basic things like health care. Um, and if you're working full time or even working two or three jobs and still not able to do that, there's a problem with what we're paying people in this country. In 2022, decades of public policy support, much of it through tax credits at the federal level, have finally narrowed the national poverty gap. But when it comes to keeping children fed, that gap is not closed. There are lots and lots of programs that help provide food to people, but if they don't know where those programs are, how to access them, um, they don't have the time or the ability to get to those places, they're still not getting the food that they need. Families know the challenge of raising children, even under the best of circumstances. Now, imagine being a single parent or even a household of two or more working adults holding down between three and four jobs to make ends meet, keep your children housed and fed with some kind of food you can afford, then fighting to produce paperwork and manage online forms with little sleep. What is the next step to reducing the barriers working families face in trying to achieve a strong, healthy, and consistent diet? Leading Indiana employers increasingly believe the answer is jobs with the wages and benefits needed to support stable and productive lives. In Indiana's economy, a sustainable wage is at least $18 an hour with health benefits. Cook Medical and Cook Group are major international manufacturers based in Indiana. They are working with goodwill of central and southern Indiana to help change both the wage and food access narrative in an Indianapolis neighborhood. It was an eye-opening experience for Cook President Pete Yonkman. When we think about insufficiency of, of food or food access, uh, quite honestly, this is not an issue I knew a whole lot about. Our first focus was on providing a manufacturing opportunity, providing jobs opportunity, partnering with goodwill to provide you know, wraparound services like life coaches and transportation, childcare, all those things that we thought would be necessities for being successful at work. So if you're, if you're at home and you can't reliably feed your kids breakfast or you don't have access to food, how do you expect somebody to show up for work and be focused on quality? All the things that we want are our employees. They want them to be engaged and thinking about the quality of the products, particularly in a field like ours where we're making medical devices. Now, not only does the neighborhood have reliable, wage-earning jobs in the partnership between Cook Medical and Goodwill, the literal front yard of the facility will boast a new partnership, one that brings a new local, affordable grocery store operated by two young local entrepreneurs. Unhealthy, convenience store food will no longer have to be the first option and sometimes the only option 
for workers or neighbors. If they're worrying about those things, then they can't think about and be engaged in the work that we're doing, particularly in a highly safety sensitive work environment. Kirsten Janik is the chief talent officer for Heritage Construction Materials. The company's workers are most obvious in road construction zones around the state, in bright vests and hard hats, placing orange barrels and repairing roadways. Dangerous work that requires sharp focus. We believe a sustainable business model is not only one that we care about employees, but one where we can manage turnover. So from a sustainability perspective for our business, it's important that we're meeting those basic needs, we're paying a living wage, um, and that employees can show up feeling like they can be engaged and that they don't need to be out looking for something else to meet those basic needs. Heritage Construction Materials and more than 60 other Indianapolis employers are part of the growing Good Wages Initiative. The Good Wages Initiative certifies, celebrates, and showcases Marion County employers who provide full-time employees a wage of at least $18 an hour and access to health insurance benefits. More food pantries will not solve the problem of hungry children in working families. They need systemic responses, like the Good Wages Initiative. I think as employers, we really have to step up, and they have the least amount of barriers and stressors in their way to do that, one of those being food insecurity. And um, it's a community issue, and we have to be good stewards of the community. The Indiana Community Action Poverty Institute has new data on working Hoosiers. The Institute found that of the 20 most common occupations in Indiana, 12 pay a median hourly wage less than $18. Nine of them are actually under $15 an hour. For example, there are nearly 100,000 people employed in Indiana as fast food counter workers. There are over 92,000 freight handlers, jobs we called essential during the pandemic. Poverty is not a choice. <laughs> Poverty is a circumstance people find themselves in. Most of them are working. And if we aren't paying people enough money to support themselves, we need to be thinking about whether or not that's a system that's fair. If you've got one in four kids who aren't able to be secure in where they're getting the next meal, that's a crisis that we need to be thinking about. We can't be successful as a state. Talk a lot about workforce development, talk a lot about opportunities. If you've got one in four kids who are struggling, uh, it's gonna be a very hard road. Research shows that government, churches, and charities respond in good, real-time ways to keep families fed. But ending hunger for good will require a deeper commitment. I do not want my neighbors to be hungry. I do not want a single child, for whatever reason, uh, to be hungry. And, and we have the wherewithal of finances, commodities, programs, passion, commitment to, um, to see that, that the people who are, for whatever reason, often not of their own making, are, 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 are helped and supported, encouraged. It's, that's the way it needs to be. In order for the economy to turn around, and in order for people to get back to normal, they have to speak up. They have a voice to use. I fought for that voice. They should use it. Almost every one of them say, I'm doing it for my kids, right? It's, I want them to see the, the benefit of what this is. I want, them, I want to improve their life. I want, to, I want them to see the value of work. So I see it as not just a way to, to change what this person's life is and to be able to make a difference there, but you're making a generational difference. If we do make it or when we do make it is, is more the question. We are going to be able to put more of an um, imprint on our community and being able to bring meaningful jobs that changes people's lives. Right now I'm drowning, you know, and without my family, I don't know where, where I would be right now. I work hard, just give me something, give me, give me some hope, you know, so I can keep moving forward.
Hi, my name is Grace Kozak, and I am the state organizer for Indiana with Bread for the World. As we saw in the film, there's no one way to end hunger, but the thing we really need is systemic solutions. Um, and so at Bread for the World, what we do is we advocate for policies that will help end hunger both in the United States and around the world. It's a problem that we need the government to step up and help us solve. We would love to meet with you and talk more about your interests and how you would like to get involved in this advocacy work to end hunger together with all of the other advocates across the network of Bread for the World. Hi, I'm Pastor Linda McRae from Central Christian Church in Indianapolis and our church is a good wages employer. Our employees are human beings and we want to treat people with dignity. So rather than forcing people to look for ways to fill the gaps between what their income covers and what they need, we would rather pay them what they need. If you're not from Marion County, you might want to start your own living wage certification initiative. Information and support are available to assist in that process. Hi, I'm David Miner. I was the founding board chair for Indy Hunger Network. Indy Hunger Network is a collaboration of all the major food assistance providers in central Indiana working to make the system work better for those who need our help. We can use professional volunteers as we work to make things better. In particular, Indy Hunger Network can use people with communications experience, people with data management experience, and people who are experienced in cooking education. Information is also available to help those who want to start a collaboration in their own town or city if you're outside of central Indiana. All right, thank you all for being here today to, to really witness that and to see the story of those families in Indiana. Um, and I also want to take a minute to thank uh, Dave Miner and David Duncan who are here today who really helped create this. You know, uh, David was, a, I believe, a producer and a videographer, um, and Dave helped with a lot of the creation and um, funding behind this film. So if we could get a round of applause for them, that'd be amazing. I think, they did a great job at really framing how big this problem is and what we can do about it. It's not just the food pantries, it's not just the employers, but it's also the government looking at that systemic ability for us to reduce food insecurity. So you did a great job and I really appreciate it. So what's going to come up next is a short video talking about food insecurity primarily in Wayne County and understanding the amount of people who are food insecure and also talking about some of the health outcomes that come along with food insecurity. Thank you for joining us today as we work together to end food insecurity in our community. This event was organized by the Wayne County Food Council, a local group of caring individuals who have linked and leveraged their skills and connections to create collaborative opportunities in their mission to end hunger across our community. Now that we've learned about food insecurity in our state, let's talk about hunger in Wayne County. The refrigerator is a common household appliance the majority of us have. But how many refrigerators look as bare as this one in our community? In Wayne County, our community is hungry, hungry for nutritious food, and hungry for change. Population data shows that 10,060 people living in Wayne County, Indiana, meet the criteria to be considered food insecure, and this number includes 2,980 food insecure children. This tells us that thousands of people are experiencing food shortages, and more than likely, they're people you know and see every day. Looking at this issue, the USDA reports that in counties with high food insecurity rates, one in eight people have diabetes, one in five people have a disability, and one in three people experience obesity. 
According to Feeding America, older adults who have experienced food insecurity are more likely to have chronic health conditions. This includes being 100% more likely to experience congestive heart failure, 64% more likely to experience asthma, 200% more likely to experience depression, and 117% more likely to experience limitations in activity. To help explain how food insecurity impacts our health and well-being, we can turn to the cycle of food insecurity. First, a food insecure household is forced to engage in coping strategies, often including the consumption of cheaper foods that are higher in calorie but lower in nutritional value. Reliance on less healthy foods can lead to poor nutrition and chronic diet-related diseases such as diabetes. These chronic illnesses can worsen existing disabilities and other illnesses or result in the inability to work and increased health care costs, which further restrict the household food budget. Once a person or a family enters the cycle, it can be increasingly difficult to escape it. So next, we have five special guests that are here tonight to help us talk about what they're doing within their organizations to help reduce food insecurity. And up first, we have Dave Miner from the Bread for the World organization. First, thank you for being here. Um, that's, uh, that's an important step. Uh, thank you for putting together this terrific event. Uh, I also want to thank again David Duncan, who uh, did amazing work in that film, the beautiful shots, the music, the voices. That's all David. Um, I want to tell you how we came to make the film. So um, I worked at uh, Lilly in Indianapolis. Um, had a chance to retire early, and I became a full-time volunteer uh, working on hunger. And uh, we came together, the gleaners and the other major players came together, maybe a little bit like your food council. I'm um, in a group called Indie Hunger Network, where we work together to try to make sure that nobody goes hungry. And the group has been running for 15 years now, and we made a lot of progress. Um, we do a lot of things better. Each of the individual agencies um, has dramatically improved their uh, food output and their food quality. Um, but we've also done some research along, <laughs> along the way. And we found that um, although we're doing a really good job of feeding people, uh, even during the pandemic when the need for food doubled, the output of the combined programs, the private charities and the federal nutrition programs, we pretty much met that demand, which is really kind of remarkable because it came up, as we all know, just like that. Um, but still, in any given week, some people can't put the pieces together. That was alluded to in the film, right? They can't, their transportation breaks down. They get fewer hours at work, you know, a whole variety of things. And so, although most of the need is met most of the time, people are not still going hungry some of the time, including kids. And food insecurity causes trauma, right? <laughs> because you're so focused on where am I going to get my next meal? Um, and so just the fact, even if people get all their needs met with the help of assistance, there's still trauma involved in this. Um, and then sort of worse than that, as we looked at the numbers, uh, this was back in 2019, just before the pandemic, unemployment in Indiana was at a record low. And it is again at a record low right now. And yet when we looked at the numbers of people who were going to the food pantries and all the other um, agencies, uh, the number of people hadn't changed at all from when we were getting started in 2009. So 10 years, and we hadn't made any progress. Now, the depth of hunger at that point was less. People had less needs, but they weren't out. They were still food insecure. And so that said, you know, we need to keep making sure that we do the best we can to feed people, but we need to do something else, too. Uh, what we're doing is good, 
but it's not enough. And that's how we came how we came to make the film. We didn't really set out to make a film about food, about uh, uh, wages, um, but the more we looked at the facts, you know, that's that's where we ended up. Um, so many families are uh, working and still not able to put food on their table. I went to visit a food pantry on the north side of Indianapolis a few years ago, a very, a run in a church. They do a really nice job. And um, I was standing in the entryway talking to the gentleman, all volunteer, of course, standing in the entryway talking to the gentleman that runs the food pantry. And he was explaining about all the cool things that they do. And in the door walked three people they run, by the way, they, their food pantry runs from like four to six on a weeknight. In the door walk three people, all wearing the same corporate logo jersey of a major Indianapolis company. My first thought was, oh, wow, they finished work and now they're coming to volunteer. No. They finished work and they had to go to the food pantry in order to be able to feed their families. And that's just, that's just not right. And so we need to look at other things. Um, the wage initiative that was mentioned in the film is one. Um, another one is Bread for the World. Bread for the World focuses on policy, trying to change policy that impacts hungry people, um, both home and at home and abroad. So uh, the more I've looked at the systems over my 15 years and the more I've worked on it, I realize that the policy side of this is critical. And so we're, we're working away trying to find advocate, people who will be willing to speak up uh, for the hungry. Um, Senator Braun is on the Ag Committee. He's the only Hoosier on the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, Representative Baird from the Lafayette area is the only Hoosier on the House Ag Committee and the Farm Bill is up this year. All of those programs that provide, or most of those programs that provide 85% of the food are in the Farm Bill. So we need them to hear from us um, how important that is. So that's enough said, I think. Um, I, let me uh, turn it over to um, Don Wolf from Gleaners Food Bank. Good evening. Um, you've seen and heard a lot of statistics. Um, I brought up with me our Gleaner's impact statement and also a page that specifically talks about Wayne County. I'm not gonna bore you with a bunch of other statistics. I'm just gonna share some important ones with you. If you would like these, stop by the table out there with the teal tablecloth and you can pick them up. But I think what's, what's impactful, so Gleaner's Food Bank is one of nine food banks in the state of Indiana. There's actually two others, so there's a total of 11. There's two that serve some Indiana counties and some in Ohio and some in Kentucky. We just happen to be the largest. The 21 counties that we serve does include Indianapolis, Marion County, but it also includes 20 other counties that I've been privileged to serve for the past eight and a half years and a lot of very passionate people. When I first started at Gleaners, we did not have a big focus on nutrition. We did not have a lot of produce. We had a room that our food pantries could come to to pick up produce that was donated by grocery stores after they picked it up, picked it off of their shelves and it didn't sell. And it was the not so fresh fresh produce. Um, now we have one of eight food co-ops, fresh food co-ops across the country that are sponsored by Feeding America that specifically work with growers to bring in fresh produce. Um, if you didn't know, you're now going to find out there are over 20 billion pounds of food that get plowed under in this country every year. 20 billion with a B, um, to be able to rescue a lot of that and get it into food pantries to distribute out to folks who really need it is very important. Um, we have one of eight co-ops that are helping to do that. We now have also branched out into proteins and um, dairy as well. 
So we're able to provide a lot of healthy food that never was a focus in, focus in the past. Food banking, when it first started, was all cans and boxes. I remember going into a church and on the bulletin board was a list of what, the, what they were donating that month for the food pantry. And it was saltine crackers, bags of rice. Um, in December, they donated red and green items. I guess cans of green beans and tomatoes. Um, but to really look at what our families need right now is nutrition. Dave talked about it. It was mentioned in the film. To be able to really, lots of people can just feed someone. They can go to a convenience store and just get food. But to get the healthy, nutritious product to really help the children grow up strong and have parents who are working have the focus to be able to do that job well and safely, we need to look at a holistic approach of not just a fed person. We need a whole, healthy, happy person. That's what's more important. Um, so a lot of that is going to take collaboration, not just a food pantry, but wraparound services. What else does that family need? We saw three families that really were struggling with a lot of other things besides just food. How can we bring folks together to the table to really work on collaborating? Um, and I am happy to say, because the wage initiative is extremely important that Folks who are working should not have to deal with a lot of the things that they are dealing with right now. Um, Gleaners Food Bank, so we are the largest food bank in the state. We have a large, over 300,000 square foot warehouse, which to put that into perspective, you can fit six football fields inside that warehouse. Um, we employ 100 people or better at any given time, and we are now part of the wage initiative that all of our employees, whether they're driving a forklift, um, doing inventory, working in the front office, all of our employees make at least $18 an hour plus benefits. So we put our money where our mouth is, and we want to make sure that folks who are working in our building aren't also having to go to a food pantry, because that's just not right. Um, we have a new CEO. We've had great leadership over the past 40 years since Gleaner was first founded in 1980. Um, our new CEO has put a real emphasis on doing the right thing and putting the people who are experiencing hunger first in everything that we do. So when we look at projects that we're doing, a spreadsheet we're working on, how is this helping a family who's hungry? How is this helping a family who needs support? And that brings it all back around to why we do what we do. Um, I'm also very happy to share with you that back in the good old days, all the cans and boxes, the rice, the saltines that you can't really make a meal out of, um, we have put a huge emphasis on not only nutrition, but specifically fr fresh produce. Um, our goal back in fiscal 21 was to have, at that point, we had a baseline where all of the food that left out of our food bank was 20% of it was produce. Prior to that, it was about mm, fresh produce. It was probably about 2% because it was all retail recovered produce that wasn't always the freshest quality. Since we got our produce co-op in place, it's called Fresh Connect Central, we now have increased that goal. Um, and here in Wayne County, in fiscal 20, in fiscal 21, sorry, where our goal was 20%, Wayne County was at 24%. In fiscal 22, we raised that goal to 30%, and Wayne County was at 35% on produce. So you guys are doing a bang up job um, of making sure that your families here have access to the healthy, nutritious product that they need. The next step is, do they know how to prepare it and cook it? You know, all of these other wraparound things that we need to make sure that we're covering as well. So far this year, this county is at 29%, and there's still, our fiscal year ends September 30th. So there's still plenty of time um, to be able to get out fresh produce, but that is so vital, and it's so expensive when you go to the store. 
and the product that you can get at a food pantry now ranges from rutabagas and onions and carrots and potatoes, celery, all of this great stuff that you can use to help build a meal um, and really nourish heart, mind, and body. So we are so thankful for all of our partners that we have here in Wayne County. Um, we have mobile pantries, we have regular food pantries, we have soup kitchens, we have school pantries that are doing the hard work, the boots on the ground. We help, we help provide the food, but all of the people that are doing all of the hard work of actually feeding the families that need it here in Wayne County is, is just phenomenal. And I applaud this group getting together, seeing this film and really seeing what it's all about. That's okay. Patrick, how do I advance the slide? Do you know? Oh, I got you. Oh. Uh, good evening. My name is Doug Macias. I'm the Community Development Manager with NATCO. Ah, it's under there. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, I didn't want my picture. <laughs> yeah I, I don't like that picture too much either, but that's okay. Uh, we'll survive. Uh, so again, my name is Doug Macias. I'm the Community Development Manager with NATCO. Um, and I say NATCO instead of NATCO Credit Union or the Empowerment Center. I'll get there in a second. And you're probably wondering what can NATCO, a bank or a credit union, what can we really be doing to help with the food insecurity problem and issues, right? Um, and I actually set a timer here. I got seven minutes. I'm gonna try. I'm probably gonna take every seven, every second um, and minute here, because my goal is is I want, hopefully everybody that walks out of here, hopefully you take away a small nugget of something NATCO might be able to do to help out whatever you're trying to do. So how can NATCO help? So where I like to start is NATCO Credit Union is not a bank. There are differences, differences between credit unions and banks. Credit unions are not for-profit institutions. So what's different about NATCO versus some of the other banks and credit unions? Number, we have two designations. We have a CDFI de designation, which is a Community Development Financial Institution, and we're low income designated for the counties that we serve. We serve the seven surrounding counties. So what does that mean? I'll give you an example. Let's say we get a grant for a million dollars. What the grantor charges us with is go out and make loans, give loans to people that can't get loans anywhere else. Give loans to people that have low credit scores. Give people loans that have no credit scores and build and offer products and services that compete with your payday lenders, your buy here lenders, your predatory lenders, because we know that once somebody is in desperate need of money and they go to one of those pay lenders, which they can go anywhere, right? From their couch, they can go somewhere and get money right now. And when you need food, when you need money to repair your car, to pay your rent, your utilities, you don't care what interest or fees you're paying. So that's one of the ways that we can do things a little bit different. So what that means at the end of the day is eight out of every 10 people that walk in our doors, we're able to approve them now. So what about those other two that we can't say yes now? Then let's kick you over to the NATCO Community Empowerment Center. The NATCO Community Empowerment Center is its own separate nonprofit. What do we do there? Our mission is we help people live better lives. How do we do that? What I like to say before I move on there is, how can we help you live a better life? It's not my job or Kaylin's job to tell you what you need to do to make your life better. You tell us what that looks like and we're gonna help you get there. So we do that through four ways. It's the four steps of empowerment. Number one is connections to resources. So when you walk in our door, what are you in need of? Is it food assistance? Is it utility assistance? Is it housing assistance? Whatever that kind of resource or tool that you might need, Hopefully we've got a relationship or a connection somewhere in town to help you get in touch with that. Number two, job seeking assistance. So if you need a computer to simply use, we've got computer stations. If you need internet, if you need to come in to take that job test, if you need to do your resume, if you need to polish your resume, we can help you with that. So you got your resume. The next step is you want to get that interview, right? 
So now you've got the interview set, but you know what, Doug, I don't have the interview appropriate clothes. So you know what? I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed to ask for help. So we have a partnership with Sylvan Nook Church. Mike is in the back. Thank you, Mike. We have what we call the career closet. So if you need clothes to go to your interview, come and get it. It's from shirts to belts to shoes to socks to high. We have a hygiene basket and we're not going to let you borrow these clothes or loan them to you. They're yours to keep. If you need two outfits, if you need three outfits. So now you've got the interview. So now we're going to do a mock interview. So that way when you get up there and you're competing against how many other people for the same job to give you that best shot at getting that job. The third step is around money management counseling. So we do budgeting, credit score, um, repair, and things of that nature. And where I like to go with that is what we always hear in this area is jobs aren't paying enough. We're not paying enough. We don't have good enough jobs. I'll meet you halfway on that because I'm, I'm tired of us always pointing the finger at everybody else as to why we have the problems. How can we own it? How can we do something about it? So I'm going to challenge you. Wouldn't you love to give yourself a raise today? Maybe the easiest way that you can give yourself a raise today is by bumping your credit score up. That's something that we can help you do. One of the things I love to talk about is I think there's a misconception in the world of credit. Every, everything that we see on TV and on our phones is you have to have this 800, 850 perfect credit score, right? The average credit scores to the people that we're doing loans for here in Wayne County is in the low sixes. So how many people out there just have a misconception or the lack of knowledge that I don't think I can get a loan? I don't think I can get approved. I don't think I can buy a house. We were just working with a company yesterday that are one of our focus areas is they've identified that 70% of their employees don't own their own home here. Why can't we get more people into their own homes? We know that when you own your own home, you take more pride in your house and you're going to take care of it, right? It's going to help improve our community overall. So I'm down to about a minute and 20 seconds. So I'm going to try to go faster. The fourth thing that we do is we have a list of classes, trainings, and workshops. Um, we do a poverty simulation, so that way people really know what poverty looks like. Because how many people out there that are involved, that they're in, they're at their desk at their job, and they're involved in planning and policy making, and they don't have any idea what poverty really looks like. So we do poverty simulations. We saw the demand. Um, during tax season last year when we did 1,500 free sets of taxes, right? Why did we do that? To help keep more money in people's pockets so they can buy more food. But what we saw last year during tax season is people were coming to us that were seeing reduces in their income. And what we mean by that is you just lost a spouse or a significant other, or I'm going through a divorce or whatever that reason may be. So we created this new workshop so we have a list of, of classes, trainings, and workshops that we do to help meet the demands of the community. Other things that we do, we, um, from the credit union as a whole, we form partnerships with the United Way, and we did a $5,000 food match last year to benefit the food pantries. We give all of our employees two paid hours every quarter to go out and do volunteer service work. We had them at Gleaners. We had them at Sylvan Nook. There's my seven minutes. If you have any questions, contact me or Kaylin. Thank you. And now I'm introducing Gabby Davis with Eastern Indiana Works. All right, I'm Gabby Davis. I'm with Eastern Indiana Works, and we are the Economic Growth Region 6 Workforce Development Board. We serve nine counties, Blackford, Jay, Delaware, Randolph, Henry, Wayne, Rush, Fayette, and Union. So if you live and work in those counties, we probably can help you. What we do, if you're an employer in here, there are a few, I know that. What we can do for employers, we right now are really focusing on training your current staff, your new hires. We have grants for that. Uh, we are looking to expand apprenticeship opportunities in our region, and we have grants coming in for that. So if you're an employer and that interests you, you're looking to train your incoming staff or expand or develop an apprenticeship program whether it is a typical you think trades program or your non-traditionals there are so many more coming out we are happy to help you look into build those apprenticeship programs and help you offset those costs with the grants that we have however if you are a career seeker or you're looking maybe you're 
unemployed, you're looking to transition into a new career, we can help you get into training programs. We have a myriad of partners throughout our region that provide training opportunities, and we have grants to help cover those costs as well. So we are all about reemployment services and helping you connect with other resources, wraparound services, and so that really is how we can help right now. What I do particularly with my role with Eastern Indiana Works is I work with community agencies and employers throughout the region. I talk to them, I get to know what they do, how we can promote them to our clients, or connect them to the partners and employers that are in our region so that they can start collaborating together to uplift these communities throughout our region. Furthermore, what I do with that, um, I help promote different opportunities and our training grants, of course, but we work together and try to establish a strategy to take these things to the next level. And so with hunger specifically, we talk retention, we talk workplace culture, we talk well-being at the workplace and in the communities, and really look at how we can make communities more livable today and tomorrow. I'm gonna stop there, but if you are interested in more information, one of the programs right now that is featured on our website, we're moving to a very virtual model called Direct Connect. This Direct Connect is kind of a one-stop shop. Many of our partners, uh, some of them are on stage right now actually, have a booth on this Direct Connect platform. Uh, and you can actually go there whether you are an employer and you want to set up a booth, a community agency, uh, or if you're a client, a career seeker, or just interested in learning more, you can go right online and find everyone's information right there, learn about what they do, and then continue that way. Up next, I am bringing up Ted Chalk. He's the vice chair of the Wayne County Food Council. Well, thank you. Um, I was going to start by telling you a little bit more about, uh, about the Wayne County Food Council, but you already know, you're aware of the Wayne County Food Council because Jay got up here and he told you that the Wayne County Food Council is putting this on. So I know you're aware of the Wayne County Food Council, but I'm not sure that everyone here is aware of how the Wayne County Food Council started and what they're really trying what we're really trying to accomplish so what i wanted to let you know is that the wayne county food council started i wrote this down here so i could say it just correctly on february 25th 2015 as a part of usda afri initiative called voices for food which originated from south dakota state university where there was an opportunity to address food insecurity and food deserts in Indiana, there were five areas that were designated as food deserts and food insecure. And just so you know the situation that Wayne County is in, Wayne County was one of those five areas. And through all of that is how the Wayne County Food Council came into existence. I'd have to say that one of the things that attracted me to the Wayne County Food Council from the very beginning, and I've been involved about a year or so after it started, is that from the very beginning there have been people in leadership and on the council who are so intentional about finding ways that we can collaborate and pull people together from the people who are, are uh, from the food pantries to the funders to the producers, how we can pull those different groups together so that we can more efficiently and more effectively deal with the food insecurity that we have, that we know we have here in, in Wayne County. Jay shared with you the, uh, the, the mission of the Food Council. I can tell you that the Food Council has just finished in this last year, we had some struggles as no one else probably did during the pandemic, but the Wayne County Food Council did during the pandemic. And uh, we have been through this last year with strategic planning as to how we can draw those different groups together, how we can be more effective in helping people find the resources, communicate, and to be more to, to more effectively meet the needs here in Wayne County. Now I'll switch gears real quickly and talk about, I cannot speak to all of the different food pantries and all the amazing work that they do here in Wayne County. But I can tell you that as the pastor at Centerville United Methodist Church and the food pantry we have, I just wanna quickly tell you about some of the things that I recognize, and I'm sure anyone that is a part of a food pantry could share the same thing with you. We see people coming in all the time when we have our, our, food, uh, our food ministry days, 
And many of those people come in and they're not really that uh, quickly to interact with you. A lot of times they pull and they've got, they've got their head down and they're, was that my timer up too, Doug, or no? Oh, okay. <laughs> But we see them with their head down. We see them that they're, I believe that this stigma that is so prevalent to people who are seeking help is really one of the things that greatly inhibits people receiving some of the help they need. There's this stigma, there's this shame, there is this in, uh, there is this self-esteem issues that we face all the time because people feel that there is something wrong with them because they need this help. And I'll just quickly try to wrap up that I think that, and I, I know many of these food pantries do this very well, but I believe what we can really do, not only as the food pantries, but each and every one of you here, one of the ways we can move forward is three things. One, compassion, consistency, and respect. If we can be compassionate in all of these areas with all of the people that we end up dealing with that find themselves in situations that we saw from this video that almost all of us in this room with uh, just some bad luck and some unforeseen circumstances and terrible things happening could find ourselves in that situation. If we can have some compassion, if we can find a way to consistently supply and meet these needs and we can show people that we interact with the respect that the base that of just being a human being and show that compassion that consistency and respect we can overcome a lot of the barriers that we find in addressing some of these problems because as doug mentioned if you go to any of those poverty simulations you're going to find out it's hard work when you're poor it's hard work to be, uh, to be financially struggling to find the help that you need. So uh, I'll be around here. Also, one thing I wanted to mention to you, that uh, if you want to know more about the Wayne County Food Council, it's www.waynefood.org. You can check out the website and see what's going on there. Thank you, Patrick. All right, thank you, Ted. And there's Ted's photo. Yeah, that was not a good one either, but it's the first one I got. No one likes their photo. And if they didn't send it to me, I might have stalked their Facebook. So, you know, Doug narrowly escaped a really good one. I'm, okay, maybe next time. So now we've had the opportunity to watch the video, learn from some organizations about what they're doing. But now we want to actually ask them some questions about how they perceive food insecurity in their community and also some things they're doing about it with some more in depth. So we have some questions and we're gonna go down the line and have them answer these questions for us. After that, we should have some time for some audience comments. And I'm gonna pick on Ted, because I've known Ted for about 10 years now. And he's the, the best treasure a nonprofit could ask for. That's right, because I have no responsibility. <laughs> so Ted, if you can turn your microphone on. It's a, there's a switch if you, yeah, right there, all right. So the first question we have today is how do you or someone you may know re relate to the reality of food insecurity? I think it's pretty easy to find people who are food insecure if we're just a little more aware of what's going on because it's a much more prevalent around us than we really, uh, than we really realize. And I, um, I'm not sure how I can answer that question the best, but um, I think the best way for us to relate to people that we see who are food insecure is what I mentioned up there just a few moments ago, to have some compassion and to have some self-respect so we can begin to form relationships so that we can begin to find ways that we can move forward and be more consistent in helping people. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, and we'll pass it off to Gabby. Uh, so, a long time ago, I was a single mom of three children. Still a single mom. Still three children. They were younger then, and I was not in the same kind of position I am now. So, it was very hard. Um, so, I relate to this pretty personally. There were days that I wondered when we were going to get our next meal, and I always had... Um, a lot of churches that came out and helped, you know, and uh, food banks. So I've been there, and that was a reality for me. And I know people still to this day that 
um, I see, and they're still struggling. And they're working families, uh, many of them two family household, uh, two parent households, and they're both working full time, just trying to make it by. But with rising costs of inflation, and um, you know, medical costs, uh, car payments, car goes out, uh, all those things add up, and you just never know what is it going to be next. You know, what what's going to happen next week. So this is very relatable to a lot of people, I believe, whether um, you know it personally or you just happen to overlook it. Okay, um, how do you or someone you may know relate to the reality of food insecurity? Um, so this is where I get real and I start getting hot and sweaty up here a little bit. Um, I relate to it personally. Um, I was sitting here trying to do the math and what it actually was. So it's kind of nice that I'm starting to forget about it. Um, but in the latter part of 2020, on a Friday night, I looked at how much money I had in my bank account. And I said, I need gas. I need shelter and I need food. So I decided to sleep in my car in the emergency room parking lot at IU up in Carmel because that's where I was living. Um, and the next day I had to check myself into a shelter. Um, but the night before I had to go to one of the local churches that had the little wooden food box and take a food box out of there and then go up to a gas station and get a plastic fork and eat a can of cold beans out of there. So I've, I've, I've literally lived it before. Um, so one of the things that I learned at that time was, and I've came up with a new phrase and I say, you don't realize how expensive it is to be broke. It sounds kind of crazy, but you don't realize it <laughs> unless you've lived it because you got to pay more for everything else. Um, but now I'm fortunate that I actually, I work for an organization. I, I work and manage an organization that is nothing but about helping people. And now I get to manage a team to help people more. And now we just opened up a new office. We opened up another empowerment center down in Fayette County at the hub. Um, so now I try to take my personal story because I can sit down with the guy right or the man or the woman, whoever's right in front of me. And I, and I can share my story. I have a responsibility to share my story now. Because, hey, I've been there before. Because I know how hard it is to admit that I needed help. And then to reach out to somebody else and say, I need help. And I don't know what that is. So there's my personal side of it. And I think you're going to find that there's a theme here in the middle of the table. Um, when I first started at Gleaners, I didn't know a lot of folks who went to food pantries. Um, and now my parents are going to a food pantry in the northern part of the state. Um, I mentioned there's nine food pantries in the state of Indiana. Um, we are the only, f or food bank, sorry, there's a lot more than nine food pantries in the state of Indiana, nine food banks. Um, but we are the only food bank who, as of 2018, changed our requirements. So Feeding America is our overarching parent umbrella for the whole country, 200 food banks across the country. Their requirement was that all food pantries needed to be open and serve neighbors at least one time per month. They had to be open for two hours, one time per month. <coughs> Excuse me. Is anybody else really liking the uh, cottonwood? Yeah. flying through the air right now. Um, back in 2018, when we opened our Fresh Connect Produce Co-op in 2017, I was tasked with, how do we get fresh produce out to our partners? How do we, how do we get them to take it? <clears throat> and I said, part of it's going to be the, the need and getting fresh items to the people who need it more than one time a month. So we made the big change to require all of our pantries in all 21 counties, over 300 partners, to serve twice a month. Because we all go to the store way more than one time a month, right? <coughs> Excuse me. My mom calls me periodically when she's gone to the food pantry. This is in another part of the state. Um, she's able to go one time a month 
because they do it based on alphabet. She's told what day she can go. So if there's a doctor's appointment for my dad or they've got something else going on or they just don't feel well enough to get out, <coughs> they can't go. Um, she called me one time and told me that, now this is for an entire month, there's only one food pantry in the little town where they live. Um, she said, yeah, we, we got some produce. They got two beets and two apples. Now, there's only two of them, but you can't really make much of a meal out of that. <laughs> um, and that was for a month. So it is supplemental food, and we get that. But had she been able to get a five-pound bag of potatoes and some onions and carrots, <coughs> I'm so sorry, cottonwood's terrible, um, that would make a huge difference. So that's, I mean, I relate directly because it's my parents. <laughs> um, so my, my story is a little different. Um, I've been working, I've been very, very, we're very, very fortunate. Um, so, but I try to intentionally stay connected. Um, so uh, the three families in the film, I was the one responsible for finding the families for the film. I spent a lot of time hanging out in um, food pantries in rural Indiana to try to find a family that was willing to go on camera. Um, and I, I learned a lot. And then I'm, I'm uh, staying in touch with these three families, um, hoping for the best for, for all of them. But that, uh, I fell in, fell in love with all the people in the film, especially the families, and uh, so that's, that keeps me grounded. All right, thank you. So <coughs> thank you all for sharing. A lot of that was personal, and I know that that could be tough, and that can bring up some some hard thoughts and feelings. But I, I appreciate you all sharing how you're connected to that. And talking about though, I want to actually skip to the third question and look at where should our energy and resources go to reduce food insecurity. Um, and again, I'll pick on Ted. I believe our, our energies and, and our, our resources need to go in finding ways that we can be more consistent because as we've talked about and as we saw from the film, the, the needs are so diverse and there's so many different uh, ways that those needs could be met and we have to figure out ways that we can collaborate all across the board so that it is so much easier for people to find the help that they need and the resources that they need in order to help improve themselves and pull, help pull themselves out of the situation that they find themselves in. With Eastern Indiana Works, I believe with my role particularly, I have an opportunity to collaborate and work beside employers and community organizations. And part of what Eastern Indiana Works is striving to do right now is create those essential uh, connections within our communities that we serve in our nine county region, see how we can work regionally, uh, countywide, and begin developing those partnerships and strengthening them. Uh, one of the things I already mentioned was Direct Connect, a virtual platform. But another thing that we're really striving right now to do, especially with our employers, is sit down and have those tough conversations. Well, none of it's easy, and I don't think that it's going to be quick by no means. We have seen progress and um, slow, and we have started seeing mindsets change as our employers um and their staff are becoming more educated and aware not only on food insecurity uh, but the greater need for w uh, increased wages health benefits and a, and a myriad of other things uh, you can name it the cost of living housing access transportation child care costs uh, these are things that we work together on as a team at eastern indiana works with um, a variety of partners across our region and things that we continue to address um, so it's just developing those relationships and seeing how we can strategically connect and collaborate and I think that's one of the greatest ways we can spend our 
energy, at least in the beginning. Uh, some of my thoughts are around, and it's some of a rep- repetition of what you guys have shared, um, but I think that we have to do a better job as a community connecting more, working together more, working together better, telling our stories better. I mean, this room is a perfect example. I mean, we've got good attendance, but with all the organizations that are represented in this room, we should have done a better job at the Empowerment Center of getting more people here to hear what's really going on. Um, and our common response is, well, we sent an email out. Well, we, we, we put it on Facebook. We got to do more. What the definition of more is, I don't have all the answers. Um, I think we have to do a better job when we're, t- um, when we're in the roles that we're in. I think a lot of our default is, is hey, here's my website. Yeah. Here's my card. Here's a flyer. The people that are coming to us looking for services, that's our response. Here's a website. Here's a card. Go see them. I'm on my lunch hour. I came to you for help. I don't have time to take more time off of work to go to all the other places that I need to get the help. Um, so I think that we need, we, need, we need to do a better job too of, of knowing what's actually going on at Reed, what's actually going on at Neighborhood Health because we're sending people there but how many times have we never been there ourselves and really know what services that they're offering. Um, I'll stop there, thank you. Again, I'm going to I'm going to continue um, what you just said because I was in Shelbyville earlier today um, with groups of possible participants <coughs> and also donors on a hub, bringing those wraparound services together. So I think time and resources, energy going into <coughs> it's every time I talk, somebody's trying to tell me something. Um, all of the surfaces that are available you know transportation is a big challenge for people with food insecurity in a lot of cases one-stop shops where food can be a great convener but can a pantry or can a hub a social services hub have more services that people need rather than you know sending them out say oh well you need to go to this place for that and that place for this they're they potentially would need to go five different places and those things could all be done in one spot Um, we've successfully helped facilitate some hub type situations in Fayette County Um, we have one I believe you were just talking about it as well um, that used to be it was a grocery store and then it was a doctor's office and now it has a food pantry and a whole host of other social services in it Um, there's a lot of that kind of talk happening right now in a lot of our counties. Um, Nonprofit centers that really can be a one-stop shop. And I think putting putting focus and energy into something like that in a lot of the rural communities in this state can really help a lot because transportation is an issue in just about every county. I think mostly it's already been said. The one thing I would add is I think we need to also put a small percentage of our, you you won't be surprised by this, Patrick, a small percentage of our effort into the big picture. Um, And if you'll forgive a short story, the first thing I did when I retired was uh, work uh, as the volunteer executive director for um, something called the Interfaith Hunger Initiative in Indianapolis. We were doing two things. We were supporting improvements in food pantries and also supporting um, a school lunch program for AIDS orphans in one particular part of Kenya. And uh, not due to anything of my skills, we raised uh, three quarters of a million dollars uh, over six years. Um, And so we were feeding um, 3,000 kids in Kenya a daily school lunch, which was just phenomenal. But during that six years, there was a single vote in Congress one vote that took $800 million out of something called the McGovern Dole International School Lunch Program that feeds kids and programs just like we were doing. So one vote in Congress did 2,000 times as much damage um, as what we had been able to do. I, I don't regret any of the time I spent raising the money and doing the good work that we did, but we should have been also paying attention to the big picture. All right, thank you for that feedback. 
So we've talked a lot about what organizations can do and what our organizations are doing to reduce food insecurity in our community. Um, but I want to pick your guys' brains about what can community members do? What, can, what are some actionable items that community members can engage in to help reduce food insecurity for our community? Um, I'm not going to pick on Ted this time. I'm actually going to throw it back to Dave. And because, you know, he's probably caught him off guard. So just thinking, what can everyone do? What can we do tomorrow uh, when we wake up? What is one thing that we can do to help reduce food insecurity for our community? The first thing I'd say is um, get get people, not, not because of we're, get, we're not getting any royalties on the film. It's free to anybody that wants to use it. I'd say uh, use the film as a tool to get other people aware of the issue, okay. right? Um, we just, uh, I think it was said a minute ago, we just don't have enough people who know, right? Um, I know a wonderful volunteer at St. Vincent de Paul um, in Indianapolis who's, after he retired, he's just devoted his life to it. And he serves on the Gleaners board. Um, Don knows who I'm talking about. Um, he's, he's just done an amazing job. But what he says is, I drove by it for the 30 years that I was working and I didn't see it. Um, so there's a lot of really good-hearted people that just don't know, and we need to help get. We need to help people know. Okay. Thank you. I would absolutely second that. Um, I was asked the same question earlier in Shelbyville. Um, they were talking about, you know, what what can we do immediately? What's the next step right away? We know there needs to be funding and all of these other things, but. One thing that doesn't cost any money is every single person in this room can go out and advocate. Go out and talk to your neighbors, your coworkers, people at the softball game. Share what you just saw in this film and what you took from it, what really had a big impact for you. Advocacy doesn't cost anything. It's sharing what you know because you're right. You can. You can drive by it. These families could be people who live in your neighborhood. You don't always see it. Folks don't always know what someone might be struggling with. Uh, when I first started at Gleaners, I was told that we don't judge inside our walls and because you can't make assumptions about anybody. Um, my boss at the time, when in the interview, she said, we had somebody come in driving a Cadillac, wearing a fur coat in the wintertime. And <clears throat> she said a lot of people would look at her and go, she doesn't need to be at a food pantry. Well, she did because the car was borrowed and the fur coat was the last gift that her husband had gotten her before he passed away. And now she needed help. You cannot imagine the folks that really need the help by just looking at someone you can't make that kind of a judgment call that's not for any of us to make but what you can do is go out and talk to people talk to like-minded people people who want to make a difference or people who aren't like-minded and think that there's not a problem in this county you know in any of our rural counties talk to folks and tell them there is you don't realize how many families who are working, are struggling with some of the challenges that we saw in that movie. The the entire state is struggling with it. So advocate, advocate, advocate. My response is going to be do something. <laughs> do something. Kaylin hears me in my corny sayings all the time, but I, I say we we think too much, we talk so much, we got to do more. We got to do something. Thinking about it and talking about it doesn't get a whole lot done. We got to show up. Show up at one of the food pantries and help. Help do something. If you're not physically able to, to actually do that, I don't know. Ask them, what, ask them what they actually need. I think that's another one of our weaknesses is we sit back and we take the inventory and we think that we know the answers and we know what they need. Maybe ask them the question, what do you really need? The, the funding, the, the money always comes up. Yes, funding is critical, but they need hands and feet to do the work. Um, that's good for now. 
I'm going to second what he said. Do something. I am a huge advocate for volunteering in your local communities. Uh, some of the things that we also do, I promote volunteer opportunities. So if I know of them, I share those with our staff and clients uh, so that they know, like, here's ways you can get involved and stay involved in your community. Um, part of the benefits of volunteering go beyond just, you know, a, the way it makes you feel, obviously, but you're doing something to help somebody else and a greater good. And it could be as easy as making phone calls or sending out invitations. It, you could be physically on site packing uh, bags or um, reach out to a local nonprofit. If it's not a food pantry that interests you, there are so many nonprofits that need support. And through those methods, that's how we build a, a stronger and more vibrant community everywhere we go. Um, so definitely do something. Um, and that's really all it's going to take, I think, in, in this in this manner. Um, and it could just be sharing those Facebook posts, you know, how they say, shop local, share it with your, you know, share your small businesses with your community. It's the same thing. Share, share it. Make personal invitations to events like these. If you know somebody, hey, bring a friend, right? Well, I agree, and I can tell you how you can do something. The Wayne County Trustee's Office puts out an email regularly of every food pantry in Wayne County. It puts, and in that email, it also includes every place that serves a free meal and which day of the week and what time that's done. Also tells you where the clothing closets are. So any food pantry you know, they have access to that email and if you really want it just call the Wayne County Trustees office and they can get you on that email list and you can look down there and you can find any and I'm sure that every one of those uh, food pantries or groups that provide a meal for people will be more than happy to allow you to come along beside them and work and help all right thank you thank you so in the, the famous word to Doug do something right do something so uh we we're getting close to the end of our time here today so we have one question left i'm going to modify it a little bit so the question is what is currently working to reduce food insecurity in our community i'm going to ask everyone this question starting with ted again but i want you to just use one word to tell me this one word to tell me what is currently working to reduce food insecurity in our community Collaboration. <laughs> Kindness. Willingness. Education. Caring. Caring. All right, thank you, thank you. So now we have the opportunity to open it up to the audience and we do have time for questions and we have a microphone that we can run to you. Um, so we just need you to raise your hand and we will offer you a microphone and you get to ask the ex experts some questions about food insecurity and what you can do in the community. I think I see some interest over here. Is there, I see smiles. Does anybody want to ask a question? No? Okay. This is exciting. This is like engagement. You guys get to ask some S experts, you know? There's, you could ask Doug a question. Doug likes to talk. Do something. <laughs> I saw a hand, all right. My question is forward looking. Um, if on June 1st, there is no debt reconciliation and government services are not available to people in need. Are there provisions already in place locally to help people address things that might escalate from that, from that happening? If, if it comes to shutting down of all of the support you saw in the film, 85% of food assistance comes through federal nutrition programs, SNAP, WIC, school meals, and so forth. There is absolutely no way 
for private charity to make that up. So if it comes to that, and, God, and we, we all pray that it doesn't come to that, um, people will go hungry. That's quite. That's quite. It's quite that simple. They're just. It's. There's no way to make up that huge volume of food. Because we are really worried about that. Because we are. We are communities and schools, and so school will be out by then. So not only will families not have their personal abilities, but they will also not be in school. So they won't be getting breakfast and lunch either. So that's very very concerning. Yeah, it's a very ser- it's a serious issue. Yeah, yeah. I would say we also have um, a lot of our pantries in schools, and one of the things that we are really encouraging, I won't say requiring, but encouraging, is that those school pantries be open throughout the summer um, when it's possible. Um, we there's a lot of conversation at Gleaners too about you know what's going to happen since the pandemic you know during the pandemic there was all kinds of food and government money coming in and um, that has really started to drop off quite considerably Um, and so we've we've made adjustments in our food distributions knowing that the the program it's TFAP it's the emergency food assistance program the USDA commodities the amount of food that we're getting from that program with just the total poundage of it going so far down, we are making adjustments and trying to mitigate that um, to make sure that our food distribution still have enough food. But there's a lot of our food pantries that participate in that program that are gonna see a big cliff um, and they're gonna need to look for other ways. That food is all at no cost to those food pantries. And if that continues to drop, there's going to be a need for more donated food, more funding um, for them to be able to purchase food from food banks um, at lower costs and be able to to sustain the pantry. Um, Gleaners, I don't know about other food banks in the state, but Gleaners does provide all produce and milk to our agency partners at no cost. So at least there's some things that they can get from us that aren't going to really break the bank but that it's going to have a big impact if it happens Uh, but i'd like to weigh in on that and i'm by no means a financial expert uh, but being in the in the banking industry take the june one date away and when you look at just the state of the economy when you have local manufacturing companies making products here in richmond that their products don't hit the shelves for six to eight weeks, no, I'm sorry, six to eight months, and they're saying it's slower than, it's, than they've been since 2007 and eight. The air smells a lot like, the economy smells a lot like it did in 2007, 2008. So I think it's safe to say that people's pockets are going to get tougher and thinner and leaner. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's we as a community had to find ways to do more faster. I think that's why, I mean, who's hurt the hub that we're talking about down in Fayette County? Who's familiar with that by a raise of hands? So some hands went up, some didn't. But ICAP purchased, and I could be wrong about some of this, but what the Fayette hub is now, we moved the office down there. So under that roof, we have ICAP, Eastern Indiana Works, United Way, the Community Sharing Food Pantry, the Food Council, the Salvation Army, Fayette County Voices, we're all underneath one roof. We didn't have a fully baked plan for NatCo to go down there and open up a new office. We went down there because the needs are there. The needs are going to continue to be there, and it's the right thing to do. I think we have to focus on surrounding ourselves with yes people, surrounding ourselves with people that are going to be solution-focused and not just saying it's always been this way or it's too big of a problem to tackle. We have to find ways to come up with better solutions, period. I would say on a more encouraging note, I mean, if that happens, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. But I think what is encouraging is if we remember when the pandemic started and the schools closed and there was concern about how children were going to get food, especially those that we knew were in need. uh, I can tell you about Centerville. 
uh, when they weren't else, the Centerville schools were not eligible for the federal and the state uh, resources to feed those children. And there were four or five community groups and churches that came together and say, how can we get this done and how can we make sure there's food? And two days a week, there was a long line at different times that was provided away that food was figured, it was figured out how to make sure there was some food available. I know at Richmond, I'm not as much of a, uh, of what happened in Richmond, but I know there were people who wanted to step up and help out in any way they can. So I don't know how uh, the problem will be solved. But the one thing I think that I'm confident in saying that there are many people who really do care and if we get in a position like that, they will come together and figure out how to at least do the best they can to make some sort of difference. And just on a final note, uh, the Workforce Development Board, we are in consistent communications with uh, state departments um, and other partners on, and we're keeping an eye on what is going on. So if and when, uh, layoffs start occurring around our region in massive numbers. We are um, we're ready uh, and ready to respond and ready to respond quickly. All right, thank you, thank you. I think that was a great question. Thank you for those responses. I think we have one more question in the audience. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to raise a question up regarding as far as getting more food to people in the community that's in that work struggle, uh, as far as the late hours, what do you see as a solution for that? I know we just recently saw the uh, cleaners drive that was out at the fairgrounds and the mass of response to that. It, what do you see as possibilities for more like that? to help those that are working the eight to five. So we encourage, again, not require, we encourage all of the food pantries in our entire territory to really try to place a focus on being open in the evenings and weekends. Um, being open one to three may be a great time to get volunteers um, if they're retired and you know they're they're home but if they're retired they're probably going to be older probably 80 to 85 percent of the volunteers that work in food pantries are elderly and so when you go out and you visit all of these pantries like steve and i do often one of our first questions is do you have a succession plan who's going to pick this up and continue this work when you're no longer here um but a lot of the pantries have set their hours based on when they know they can get volunteers. It's a little more difficult, but to really serve the neighbors who need the assistance, who are the working hungry, you've got to be open when they can access. It's all about accessibility when they can access. So it's got to be evenings and weekends, and it might be harder to find volunteers then, but that's when you're really going to get the biggest bang for your buck in, in bringing a truck out or having a pantry open. Okay. All right. What I'll add to that is, and it's something that I keep saying more and more, we, as in the community, regardless of it's food distribution, whatever the, the service or need is, we have to do a better job of meeting people where they are when they need us to be there, period. We, we have to find a way to do a better job of doing that. But I'll, I'll take it a step further. I believe that we also have to do a better job of not just giving away the fish. We have to find a way to teach them the fish. There's going to be certain people that are going to be in that cycle, and they're, they're okay with it. And they're comfortable and content with it, and they always will be. But one of the things I, I do believe about this community being a newcomer to Richmond and Wayne County, there's a lot of people right now that are hungry for change younger and older they're tired of the same old same old they're tired of the problems so i think we have to quit putting bad band-aids on things and figure out a way to to help people get out of that cycle one of the things that we talked about at our last tenant meeting down in fayette is let's say 1200 people came to get food last month 
So my question to my staff is, what are we doing with all the things that we do? What are we doing to help them people where maybe someday they don't have to come back? There's 1,200 people at our door. I think that's one of the benefits of having the hub, maybe not an all-stop shop, but a, a multiple-stop shop. How can we help partner together and bring the solutions to the table to help get out of some of these cycles? And it's going to take generations. Let's be realistic. Where we got today, it didn't happen yesterday. It's going to take us time to get there, but we have to start somewhere. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Um, we have two more slides to get through. I'm going to pass it over to Jay after that for a closing. Um, but I want to bring some attention to the Wayne County Food Council. Um, they really helped spearhead this event tonight, and they do a lot of great work in the community. Uh, if you want to get involved, and in the words of Doug, do something. That's, we're going to get posters now. You guys know that, right? <laughs> so on July 19th, from 11 a.m. to 1230, the Wayne County Food Council is having their general meeting at the First Bank Coleman Center at the fairgrounds. Um, lunch is provided by Reed Health Community Benefit. And if you want to RSVP to attend that, the email address is wcfc at waynefood.org wcfc at waynefood.org all right i'm going to pass it over to jay and he'll give us some closing remarks i'd like to take just a moment to thank all the panelists for contributing their time and their experience and their expertise to this topic um, i've learned a lot i've learned a lot and i would also like to thank all of you for coming tonight you didn't have to be here but you chose to and you know everything that is involved in change always begins with being interested in making a difference making a change and so i thank everyone and i wish you a good evening